Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we will be exploring parapsychology as a deviant science. With me is sociologist James McLennan. He is the author of Deviant Science, the Case of Parapsychology. His other books include Wondrous Events, Foundations of Religious Belief, Wondrous Healing, Shamanism, Human Evolution, and the Origin of Religion, and The Entity Letters, a Sociologist on the Trail of a Supernatural Mystery. Once again, this interview is being conducted via Skype, so now I'll switch over to the Skype video. Welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. You've, you've really spent your whole professional career looking at the paranormal from the perspective of the science of sociology. Well, I started out as a sociologist of science, and we'll have to talk about that today a little bit. I didn't, I'm more of a sociologist of religion these days. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty close. I mean, because I don't know of any religion that doesn't incorporate into its sort of founding ideology the notion of uh, what we call the paranormal or the supernatural. Well, that's true. Yes, very much so. Yes. And uh, the the unique thing about parapsychology is, is that parapsychologists are saying this acceptance of uh, something beyond what can be explained in terms of physical science, uh, nevertheless, can be studied using the methods of empiricism. Yes, yeah, most definitely. And uh, I gather that's where the problem occurs uh, in your book, Deviant Science. You, you point out that many, many segments of the scientific community uh, are unwilling to accept empirical data when it comes to uh, extrasensory perception, psychokinesis, and survival after death. Well, yes. And so I was a uh, graduate student at the University of Maryland, and they assigned me to teach in the field of deviant behavior. I was a, theoretically a, going to be an expert in deviant behavior. So so then I, I kind of hit upon this field, the field of parapsychology, and I was, I was pondering it as a form of deviant behavior and put together a kind of a theoretical model that I, I hoped would explain it. And I, I started off with what scientists were writing about, what sociologists were writing about science, and the, the cornerstone of everything was Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Mm -hmm. And Kuhn argued that, Scientists come upon anomalous phenomena, and then that eventually brings them to, you know, make a scientific revolution. So it would seem that that might be appropriate for parapsychologists. They're trying to make a kind of scientific revolution. But if you read into the sociology of science, Thomas Malkay, or excuse me, Michael Malkay had another important book, The Science and the Sociology of Knowledge. And he pointed out that there's a kind of a rhetorical and political process, that there's a relative quality to science. It's not, it's not as objective as you might think. So the scientists are engaging in their activity and they're coming across anomalies, and then they engage in a kind of rhetorical and political process, and particularly the social scientists, psychology and sociology, there's a lot of politics and rhetoric in that something which is in fashion during one era goes out of fashion and then the scientists move on to something else. So there's scientific revolutions, but it's not as objective as you might hope. Mm. And then he was also arguing that that's also the case in physics. There's a, there's a political process. So I was, I, in 1979, I traveled around the country and interviewed parapsychologists all over the country, California, Texas, Virginia, New York. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I saw something that seemed to be a little bit different. In other words, it seemed that the 
the phenomena that so, that parapsychologists were looking at were a kind of rejected anomaly. So uh, I put a rejected anomaly as yeah. opposed to an anomaly that gets embraced. Yes, an anomaly that draws interest. A, a typical a typical scientific revolution attracts attention of scientists. They they make their careers in the field. They become you know they get tenure. They become famous, and the anomaly is accepted, and then the anomaly is explained, and the revolution, scientific revolution occurs. And it, it doesn't take that long a time. It takes maybe 10 years or 15 years, and uh, the process occurs. But parapsychology in the 1980s when I was doing this, it had been going on since 1934 with J.B. Rhine. So it, it was what I refer to as a deviant science. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was in the field now. I have to admit that I, when I was in graduate school, my first objective was to get a PhD and get a decent job. That's what I hoped would happen. So I was working with what I had, and I had these different theories in sociology. And if you want to graduate, you have to do what they tell you to do in a way. Yeah. So, so we're going to use the theory, the theories of sociology to try to explain the phenomena, but it wasn't fitting very well that apparently some anomalies are rejected. So I created a kind of theoretical model, and we have rejected anomalies, and that leads to stigma for the scientists, and then the scientists somehow have to support themselves. So the field of parapsychology is being supported by, uh, you know, benefactors, by mm-hmm. lay groups which mm-hmm. are supporting the field, and then so all these there were there were some, you know, thirty some research centers. And they were being supported by lay groups and, and continuing J.B. Ryan's paradigm. Well, so you're, the anomaly that you saw is, uh, I gather, that parapsychology shouldn't have survived as long as it did without being embraced by the mainstream yes. at, at some point. Either they would either be successful or they would fail relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. So. So it seemed something unusual is going on, and it would seem that there's a certain kind of anomaly which is rejected by science. So the question is, why is that? And I, I don't know. Uh, we'll have to talk about that a little bit. You know, I, but it would seem that so these scientists are being stigmatized. And then I traveled around and, and, and thought that that would be they would constitute some kind of cult like behavior. But that wasn't at all the case. The parapsychologists were embracing science more than normal scientists, mm-hmm. and so we so we have the term scientism, the concept that science has some kind of hidden ideology which is justifying its practices, and so the the parapsychologists in a way they were embracing scientism, they were trying to become more scientific than the regular scientists, which is and, not what you expected to find. No, I expected it to be like a religious cult, mm-hmm. to, be, to be people who were embracing, they were embracing an ideology and looking for data to support that ideology. But that isn't what they were doing at all. They were trying to figure out what the, what the phenomena was to the degree that's possible within the confines of regular science. Mm-hmm. And now, the fact that parapsychology has persisted, and I think it's fair to say if you include psychical research, uh, the Society yeah. for Psychical Research was founded in 1882. So we're talking about 136 years of scientific investigation into mediumship, altered states of consciousness, paranormal phenomena, psychokinesis, extrasensory perception, survival yeah. after death. Um, you, your sociology studies would have suggested to you that this should not have lasted so long. Uh, and, and yet it, it dawns on me, take the Copernican revolution in, uh, astronomy, the idea of a, a heliocentric solar system. Uh, that took, I think, hundred, many hundreds of years. But there, there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't the same kind of scientific establishment in those days. Yeah. And there wasn't the same power within scientism. Science has a certain power in modern society. It's, it's aligned with secular forces and secular belief systems. And so it, there's a large number of people participating in the endeavor and and so they they have a, a hierarchy among themselves, and so that was my 
that was my idea was to try and then and then the nature of what they reject would then define scientism we could determine what's allowed what isn't allowed by what's being accepted and what's being ejected, uh, rejected and it would seem that the psychic phenomena was definitely being rejected uh, in fact I found it myself I got my PhD and it turned out uh, you know, my advisor said, well, we called it deviant science. So people realize that you're, you know, you're, you're an expert in deviant behavior. But my, you know, I went for job interviews and they said, well, there's certain things we can't really allow in the classroom. And this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to get a job, you know. <laughs> so the, the stigma is very, very intense. So if you, if you're going to go into this field or even study this field, you're going to pay a very stiff price. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a penalty involved. And one thing that I did as part of my dissertation was send out a questionnaire to, to the elite members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And that, that stimulated a huge amount of feedback. Uh, about five or six of these elite scientists sent letters to the University of Maryland and tried to get me kicked out of graduate school. It was a very, very strange experience for, for a, a graduate student, mm -hmm. fledgling, fledgling sociologist. Yeah. To, and I, I, I was somewhat depressed, but at the same time a bit thrilled. It, it, it seemed that I was putting my, my finger on some kind of strange nerve, yeah. which has not been recognized or people hadn't thought about it. You know, we, we understand there's a fear of death and sexuality is certainly an issue. Deviant forms of sexuality, minority groups are fearful. Some people are very afraid of minority groups. And here's something which stimulates a very, very intense fear from elite scientists, asking them questions about extrasensory perception. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's it, you. It's interesting you should mention the fear factor because uh, after yeah. all, it's been only uh, a little over 200 years, I believe, since uh, here in the United States, we were burning witches at the stake. Yeah, so now we've turned our attention to immigrants and gay people and, uh, you know, minority groups and uh, people such as parapsychologists. <laughs> but, but we're, not, you're not burnt, we're not burning a mistake, though we are putting uh, children in cages. That's a little bit distressing. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, so I, I sent out this questionnaire to the elite scientists, and then that gave me a chance to compare that data with previous similar studies. You ask them, what's your attitude towards extrasensory perception? And uh, it turns out a very small percent considered ESP an established fact. And among the, the elite scientists, it was 3.8%. And among regular college professors, it's 16.3%. So there's a big difference. And to, to consider extrasensory perception a likely possibility, 25% of the elite scientists and 49% of the regular college professors. So there's a big difference. And uh, so there's something associated with the, with the social status within science that creates this. In other words, the, the people who are, it, these elite scientists are the judges, They're the ones who determine whether your, whether your result you know, gets published or not. Mm -hmm. Well, in your book, you talk about a very interesting episode in which the American Association for the Advancement of Science was uh, petitioned by the Parapsychological Association for formal affiliation. That was back in 1969, and after uh, a very heated debate, actually, uh, the Parapsychological Association was admitted as a, an affiliate scientific organization. So, that conferred a measure of legitimacy, I should think, on parapsychology. Well, most definitely, but there was there was an issue which was not completely settled, per se. In other words, Margaret Mead stood up and made a wonderful speech, and everyone applauded, and the, the parapsychologists did a huge amount of incredible lobbying, and that, that really is how they were successful. But the question is, what? why does a, why does a scientist believe in extrasensory perception? What causes a scientist to come to accept it or not? Yeah. And so I got a certain insight to that because I, I had this questionnaire that I was planning to mail out to them 
to the elite scientists. And I took it to scientists at the University of Maryland, and I sat with them in their office, and I would give them the questionnaire and watch them as they filled it out. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and, I, and I would ask them questions. Why do you think the way that you think? Now, the first thing that I found was a lot of them were just really angry at me. This this was taking up their time, and they had better things to do, and that <laughs> I really should recognize, I should realize that what I was doing was just basically wrong, you know, uh -huh. and I should be punished in some way. Yeah. But, uh, but, and then there was one scientist who had, uh, he had uh, made some, he felt he had made discovery about gravity waves, and this had turned out to be a false trail. He'd made a, a mm. bad Poor, it was something was wrong with his methodology, mm. and he particularly was sensitive and was really angu anguished that I would come to him with this thing, which seemed even worse than what he had done. You know, mm -hmm. but but I remember there's a there's an insect uh, expert, a, an expert in spiders, and uh, he had all kinds of uh, uh, sample, different size spiders in his all. You know, but most of them were deceased, but mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, all kinds of books about spiders. And he, he sat down and, and, and started talking to himself and saying, what do I think about extrasensory perception? Is it possible that our minds can be connected to each other? And he was silent, you know, kind of pondering that question. He said, well, compared to spiders, this isn't really that difficult, you know. What, think of how small a brain a spider has, but they're somehow able to make their webs. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible. It's absolutely impossible. So if you think about the nature of science, a lot of the, the questions that they're dealing with are are impossible. It's, it's just it's so astonishing that the spider can create such a complex web. So why not, you know, is his way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So and, he considered a likely possibility. You know. There's quite a bit of literature coming out these days in the area of insect uh, and spider communication suggesting something like a uh, much more consciousness than we had anticipated and maybe even something of a group consciousness. And, uh, you know, uh, a squid and cuttlefish and octopus in the ocean have their own special kinds of consciousness is a it's amazing the, the field of consciousness is a very very interesting thing endeavor to get involved with so i was i was trying to figure out well, why do these expert scientists if they're most of them are not familiar with the literature yeah. and so in the questionnaire that i sent out i i asked them what's the source of your information about parapsychology and the most prevalent source is newspapers strangely enough mm. that whatever they read in the newspapers that influences their beliefs but that didn't really influence in one direction or another mm. the thing that seemed to enter the seemed to the thing that seemed to to channel a scientist in one direction or another was the way that that the source which they considered most important and so there's a there's a the the a priori method of thinking that to to think that there's a a kind of deductive process within science and certain things are self-evident that leads to skepticism the skeptic mm -hmm. says there's a certain self-evidence that the phenomena can't occur, so therefore any kind of research in this area must be flawed. And then the other side of the coin was personal experience. The scientists who had personal experiences were believers, and the ones who didn't weren't believers. Mm -hmm. So this is what I came across in the questionnaire. And I also found that I, I asked them about their personal experiences and that the, these elite scientists had a very low rate of uh, personal experience. But the ones who hadn't had experiences, they believed in the phenomena. So uh, so it's a, it was an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from talking to the parapsychologists. And I also learned a lot from just sitting around in their offices while they were working and the telephone would ring and people were calling them up and, and wanting to tell them stories and hoping they would help investigate poltergeist phenomena. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a phenomena going outside the laboratory, which I found fascinating and curiously prevalent. And no matter how much the parapsychologist might be rejected, this thing seemed to be going on, you know, mm -hmm. it's going on anyway.
Well, and we've done a prior interview about uh, an extensive yeah. investigation uh, of poltergeist-like phenomena that you were personally involved in with the Sorat Group. Well, that was the other issue. Right when I was interacting with, the, I was I was working on this manuscript. These these people in Missouri, they were talking with the spirits, and the tables were levitating, and all this strange things was going. I, I, I had started doing haunting investigations because the parapsychologists were sending me these cases. Mm -hmm. They they didn't have time, and so I was going out and talking to people who had hauntings in their house, and and I could see that these are just regular folk, you know. They're regular people, and I would suspect there's probably 10% or probably the group of people who are listening to this program, there's, there's probably like 20% of them who probably have active cases going on right now. You know, it's just not that unusual thing. It, it was hard for me to imagine that this is possible, mm -hmm. but obviously it was possible. People have these kinds of experiences. So I started uh, uh, having my students and my classes ask people, ask their friends and neighbors, because I wondered what kinds of experiences are people having? What's the most prevalent? What And what's the effect? What's the impact of these kind of things? And so I had my uh, students from the University of Maryland, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, Elizabeth City State University in Northeast North Carolina. And then I, I you know, I, I actually, I couldn't get a job in the U.S. because I had this dissertation, which no one wanted. So I spent four years overseas. I was in, uh, you know, all traveled all around Asia and went to the People's Republic of China. So I got a chance to pass out a questionnaire to three different colleges, college students at three different colleges in the People's Republic of China and also in Japan. Mm-hmm. So it gave me a huge body of, uh, and these are all random samples, random sampled, that they were a, a random sample of the population at the college. Students. Yeah, students at mm -hmm. the college. And so we found that, that uh, uh, I created a kind of scale, and it, they were standardized questions that Andrew Greeley had used regarding extrasensory perception, contact with the dead and out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. okay? So I created a kind of a psi index or scale where we just sum those all together, and then we have some people who have a lot of experiences, some people who have very little, and the percentage of people who had a fair, scored high on the index, is a, there's a, a pretty standard variation, I mean, not much variation in the United States. The University of Maryland had 22% high, you know, percentage of experiencers, mm -hmm. and uh, Elizabeth City State had 13%, University of North Carolina of Greensboro, 13%. But, and uh, the elite scientists only had 11%. They were pretty low. And the, but the, and the Japanese had 16%. It's a pretty secular society. But the Chinese had 54%. Over half of the Chinese students had a very, very high percentage of experience. And this was something which experts had told me was just absolutely impossible. They told me that in the people, this is in 1986 that they responded to this questionnaire and that it was a, they had just gone through the cultural revolution about 10 years previously. You know, it had gone on for about 10 years. And so these students had been children during the cultural revolution. And so they had been raised in an environment where it was impossible to practice religion. It was just totally unacceptable. And the, even while the, the questionnaire was being passed out, the government had a special program saying, you're not allowed to believe in ghosts anymore. It's just, it can't be, <laughs> we can't tolerate this. Uh -huh. So, so the issue is, the first question was, what's going to happen to me? Uh, should I be arrested or not? You know, <laughs> And should these, you know, there's a kind of investigation was launched. And my wife at the time saying, are we going to get out of this? You know, are we going to have to go to, we're going to have to go to prison or what, what's, what's going to happen to us? And I, I had the chance to interview Chinese parapsychologists and they were having the same problem as the American parapsychologists. There's a, there's a stigma associated with what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but the but the Chinese, I think it's kind of parallel to what happened in the United States. In the U.S., the CIA got interested, and so the whole thing got financed by our CIA. In the in the People's Republic, the Chinese military became interested, and so they collected the subjects and they began doing secret research there in the People's Republic of China. But uh, 
it, it was very parallel and strangely similar. But it turned out they let me they let me leave, and I trained graduate students. So they did two other studies after I left. And we got very very consistent results. So the the issue was why why did they have such a high level of experience? And and as the years went by, I, I came to the realization that it's that they these children had been raised in the Cultural Revolution. It was must have been very traumatic for them. And it seems that trauma and struggle in childhood is a factor, very much a factor in creating dissociation. And dissociation leads to anomalous experience. It creates a propensity for anomalous experience. To be dissociative and to be absorptive, to, be, to have hypnotic capacity, it's, re, it's related to a normalist experience. And I would think the skeptics would argue, and maybe with some justification, that 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 traumatic experience in childhood, the dissociation, could also lead them to formulate fantasies. Well, yes, they're fantasy-prone people, and that helps them to cope with uh, struggle. Now, it's psychologically, hel- it, you know, uh, we sociologists have, have done a few studies about fantasy proneness. There's a certain kind of psychological health associated mm-hmm. with this. Uh, so the, the skeptic and the, the skeptics uh, are somewhat lacking in these areas. Uh, and it, it, it generates a kind of lack of insight to think that fantasy proneness or dissociative ability to, to be able to, to ignore your the uh, unsolvable problems or troubling situations, that's actually quite valuable and psychologically healthy in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting uh, to note, uh, and uh, other researchers have found this to be the case, that people who report a lot of spontaneous psychic experiences also report um, more than uh, the average amount of trauma in childhood. Yes, child abuse. And then not necessarily child abuse, but just childhood difficulty and adolescent difficulty. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that that's another factor that, that needs to be uh, teased out. Uh, but what, one of the interesting things uh, that you report on are the strategies used by parapsychologists to cope with the uh, stigma that they're under. Well, they want to confront the skeptics. They want someone to point out to them where the methodological errors are, and then they want to correct those methodological errors. So parapsychology has been pretty much in the forefront of of statistics and statistical analysis, and the the field is one of the first fields to to engage in meta-analysis. And so it it is, from my vantage point, it, it... it throws it into the realm of rhetorical and political process. In other words, the, the parapsychologists who are most uh, established, you know, at established centers, they then achieve prominence. And people such as myself who are out in the in the back country, mm-hmm. uh, we are able to putz around and do whatever we want, it would seem, and uh, do some pretty strange things, it turns out. Mm-hmm, because... Uh, you're not being scrutinized, and, and nor are you receiving huge grants to do your work. None, yeah, none whatsoever, or virtually none. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, so I was uh, interviewing people and, and gathering cases together, and I, I got a, I would ask, I had my students do a kind of folklore research mm-hmm. in which they would ask, uh, if you have ever had an unusual, an extremely unusual experience, would you describe it? And it could, because I wondered what what are the kinds of things that people are having? What what is the nature of this thing? Because it it isn't actually just extrasensory perception. I notice and I notice there's a tendency to focus on that. We talk about remote viewing and the CIA investigating this or that. But I was wondering what is it that people are actually having? My haunting people, uh, I had not understood about sleep paralysis but my haunting people were describing sleep paralysis cases where you you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't move and a lot of times a person feels a terrible pressure on their chest like they can't breathe and so this is given this is given rise to the thought that there's a witch uh, sitting on your chest or something like that it's mm. a folklore yeah. story so the question is what is it that will people say if you've had a very unusual experience would you describe it Okay, so it 
this makes for a kind of strange response for a lot of people. Like one of the Chinese students said, well, if I had a very unusual experience, I, I don't know whether I would describe it or not, you know, <laughs> because we're not allowed to have these things here. You know? yeah. It's better. <laughs> and, well, a lot of people, uh, yeah. you've probably had this experience. I think every parapsychologist I know has had this experience, which is if you give a public presentation, someone is going to come up to you and want to tell oh, you. Yeah about their experience, and they usually preface it by saying, you know, I've never told anybody else about this before. Yeah, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. and another mm -hmm. student said, I've had a very unusual experience. I studied very hard for my exam, and my friend didn't study at all, and he got a very high grade, and I got a low grade. I find this to be extremely unusual. You know, Paranormal. Like, so, yeah, <laughs> well, well, they, they, they didn't have the word paranormal. That wasn't something they'd ever discussed or talked about. Yeah. So you see, you get a real spectrum of, of mm -hmm. people's responses. So, but, but I did have just a lot of stories which I could categorize. And, and, and in, this is in Northeast North Carolina where I was gathering these stories. And the most prevalent kind of experience that people wanted to tell about was apparitions mm -hmm. experiences. They saw apparitions and the stories, didn't really fit very well into what the parapsychologists were interested in because there wasn't any uh, element to the story which conveyed extrasensory perception or, or proved that there's life after death. Mm -hmm. But people saw apparitions. They would see something and then it would vanish before them and it would have, it was an unusual form of it, perception. So we had 34% of these stories were apparitional stories. It's, that was a, that was the main kind of story. The second one was paranormal dreams. Mm. You mean like precognitive? Well, yes, but they're not always precognitive. Sometimes they pertain to the present and sometimes they pertain to the past. But you're right. Generally, they were precognitive dreams. In other words, there's a dream which would occur in the future. The person wouldn't realize it. And then they're very, very complex and astonishingly, astonishingly beyond what you would think could happen through coincidence. Like, for example, at the University of Maryland, one of my students, I was asking them to try to, we we're, were doing a survey, a random sample survey, and we were passing out these questionnaires. This guy said that the night before, he had had a dream that he was running through the parking lot at the, at the shopping center close to his house, okay, and that someone was chasing him. Okay, so and then in the morning, you picked up the newspaper and the guy had a very unusual name, like his name was like, I, I'm just using a pseudonym, but his name was like Abraham Abramovich, mm. you know. And so he picked up the newspaper in the morning and a bank robber had robbed the bank and was running through the parking lot and the police pursued mm. him and apprehended him in the parking lot. Mm. And his name was Abraham Abramovich. Same name. The same name as my student. You know? So, so that's the kind of coincidence. These paranormal dreams are very, very compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it's beyond what you could consider uh, just coincidence. Then the third most common was psychokinesis. Nine percent were psychokinesis. Then spiritual healing was very prevalent. Six percent spiritual healing. Then we had this is Northeast North Carolina, so we had a lot of root bar stories. Yeah, it's it's like. Uh, in New Orleans, they have uh, voodoo or mm -hmm. something like that. And this is a tradition that's brought from Africa, and it's been being conducted under the auspices of Christianity. And people are doing root bore curses and root bore healing, then sleep paralysis, then waking extrasensory perception, and what I could, then I, something I called synchronistic events. Things are things coincide, but we don't know why. And then there's like a miscellaneous category, an out-of-body experience, and UFOs. People would tell UFO story. And so this seemed to be just something that's very prevalent and, and somewhat universal. Because I, I encountered the same stories all over the world, these, these, type, these types of, of stories, you know. Uh, so from a sociological perspective, what you've got is at the folk level, there, there's enormous interest and enormous reports of a wide variety of experiences, but at the level of organizations, institutions, the guardians of culture, yeah. these things are supposedly non-existent and, and even taboo to talk about. 
And the question, of course, is the prevalence. How how many, what percentage of people are reporting these experiences? It, it's more than 50%. When you when you talk to people, some some studies come up with about two-thirds of people have will come up with a story. It, it depends on how you frame the question. So I decided to use some kind of standardized method for, for creating these questions. So I, I had a question about paranormal dreams, apparitions, spiritual healing, sleep paralysis, psychokinesis, out-of-body experiences religious experience is another you know mm -hmm. and that and i found that that 66 percent of people reported paranormal dreams is a it's the majority so we've got something very strange here there's a, st a severe stigma but a majority of people have these kinds of experiences it's a, a lot of a, a lot of people are are, are aware of this mm -hmm. and, and a majority of people believe in it well, I would think that it creates a real problem for the gatekeepers who are trying to suppress this data because at least ostensibly they have a commitment to the empirical method. And you've got a situation now where you have hundreds of scientific experiments uh, typically uh, using the standard methods of science, control groups, double blinds, uh, statistics, and so on, coming up with data, many, many people in the public reporting that they're having these experiences. Uh, how do the skeptics uh, suppress this data in, in, in the face of their own commitment to uh, science? Well, that shows the way that you framed the question just then yeah. shows that you apparently don't understand how science works. <laughs> you're, you're engaging in science. You're, you've embraced scientism. Uh -huh. uh, the argument that science is a subjective method, which is, which is ever and ever coming closer and closer to truth. But it turns out that science doesn't work like that. Science is like a, like a church or a religion. And it has, a, it has a hierarchy. And we human beings aren't necessarily rational. We're not, we're not rational people. And we, we wanted to, we want to create demarcations. We want to have a, it's us versus them. And so we, we need to create, we made, we need to create demarcations. And it turns out it's very easy for scientists to make this adjudication. If you, if you try to do research in this area, you're not going to have much of a career, you yeah. know. And that, that was just my experience as a sociologist. I wasn't, big, I wasn't going to be able to get a decent job, and I wasn't going to get a career. And that's a lesson. And, and if you go into the sociology of religion, it's just kind of the same, same uh, phenomena. Uh, you'll gain support if you become a, a, an expert in, say, Catholicism, and then maybe you can get a job at a Catholic college. Or if you're, if you want to, uh, if you have a, a born again orientation, then you can get a job at a Christian college. But you need to have an audience. There needs to be some kind of supportive audience. And so let's think of our young scientist in graduate school, and he's going to study insects. He needs to study insects in the right way. You know, if you're going to go into sociology, you've got to do it in the right way. And if you go into this area, it's it it just doesn't. It's not acceptable. And it's similar to being a gay person or a member of a minority group. The majority ha has all kinds of different strategies to prevent you from really getting a equal opportunity. And they, they pretend, we pretend like we have a, there's social justice, but there, there really isn't. There's a, there's a basic injustice associated with this human realm that we're living in these days. I had a chance to I had a chance to attend a seminar about slavery in America and slavery in Africa. Okay, because I have a lot of African American students, and so I, I had this grant, and I, and I got to attend a seminar at the University of Virginia about slavery in America and Africa. And so I had gone through all the literature, it's a huge amount of literature about anomalous, unusual experience in Africa. Okay, out of body and and religious experience in Africa, particularly in uh, Nigeria and uh, places where, which were a homeland for African Americans. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I put together a journal article about this and tried submitting it. And I was told that, uh, oh, oh, the, and I, I got to hobnob and made friends with a lot of African sociologists. Mm -hmm. Okay. African psychologists. Yeah. And a lot of them were very religious people. And they 
found, they, they informed me that the way sociologists had studied them was somewhat offensive, that sociologists of religion were offensive because they referred to the reason that Africans were, had become Christianized is because it helped them gain commercial advantages and helped them maintain, you know, contact with the outside world and help them make harmony within a colonial system. And there are all these sociological explanations. And they found this to be offensive because they believed that it was because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come into their hearts and that had explained why they believed the way that they did. There's a very sincere belief. So I, I submitted these journal articles and the journal ed editors, uh, they wanted to reject the articles. And I, I, I just mentioned to one of them that, that by the way, the, the way we normally do sociology is really pretty offensive that my African friends were offended by this. And they, they wrote back and said, well, you know, what you're doing is pretty offensive too. We're offended <laughs> by it. <laughs> We find what you're doing pretty offensive, you know. The, yeah. We think sociology is doing exactly the right way, you know. And if some people are offended, then too bad for them. But, <laughs> but we're not going to publish your article about, uh, you know, near death experience and African folklore, you know, <laughs> because but we find that offensive. Yeah, yeah so, built in prejudice uh, yeah. in in sociology, sure. Well, there's a there's a kind of heuristic that that explains this. And the heuristic is what I see is all there is, you know, like if I ask you a question, you search your memory. We say you ask me a question. I'm going to search my memory bank. And if I can't find it, then I can't believe that it really exists. So mm -hmm. when you talk, you ask a, a person who's had a, a paranormal experience, they search their memory and there that experience is so they can believe it. Yeah. But a, a skeptic doesn't have that experience. So when you follow that heuristic, what I see is all there is. The thing doesn't occur. It can mm -hmm. occur because it's not in my memory. I have not seen it, mm -hmm. so therefore it can't really exist. And it's a, it makes it life a lot simpler mm -hmm. to use a heuristic way of thinking. Of course, for, for me, and I suspect for you as well, I have hundreds of paranormal-like experiences in my memory. Well, but mine are a little bit too strange. <laughs> <laughs> I've been exposed to a little bit mm -hmm. too it's really kind of parallel to being in Vietnam. Actually, when I was in Vietnam, I got it was a it was way off what was acceptable. What it can't really be tolerated. It can't doesn't it fit in? And so I realized I'm out of I'm out of step. I'm out of phase with with regular folk who haven't had those kinds of experiences. And it's hard for the non-believers and the believers to really there's there isn't a good intersection for them. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard for them to understand each other. Well, and Martin Luther King uh, once said, the arc of justice uh, is long, uh, but it, it does eventually bend toward justice. And well, over time, one would think that, uh, uh, you know, given, given enough time that the errors and mistakes and folly uh, all human beings have, that the scientific method should be capable uh, of eventually correcting that. Well, maybe, okay, so that's where you and I come in here. Yeah. You no. Know? So what is it that makes for success within the realm of science? So the first step would be to come up with some kind of theoretical orientation, which generates, to, we, if we're, if we're going to play the game, we have to embrace scientism, mm -hmm. okay? We have to accept the idea that science is a logical process. We have to come up with some kind of theory. Yeah. So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking how uh, the nature of consciousness, how did consciousness evolve within human evolution, mm -hmm. Okay. But let me step so, back for just yeah. a second, Jim, because yeah. I think you and I maybe have different definitions of scientism. I've... I would identify uh -huh. scientism not with the embrace of the scientific method. To me, that's science, not scientism. Scientism, to me, is elevating the, the metaphysics, the ethos of science to a, a religion. And by that, I mean materialism. That Well, that's an acceptable definition that you just presented. Yeah. But that definition irritates the scientists. They Like the scientists who received my questionnaire, a lot of them were very much irritated. Some of them even wrote in the margins, uh, I think that you're trying to hurt us in some way. You see? Oh. 
So, so your definition, you're trying to hurt the scientists because you're pointing out a kind of hypocrisy. And, and all of us humans have that. We yeah. humans engage in heuristics. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to think that deeply. I know you're trying to stimulate us. You're trying <laughs> to get us to think. But we humans don't have time for that. We want to make short, easy, quick evaluations. Yeah. So if we think of science, like say I'm a sociologist, I need to learn what the correct methods are follow those methods, and then maybe I'll be advancing my career. So, so if we're going to engage in science, we need to come up with a theory, a testable theory. And so now you can say that, the, that they already have one, say the Gonsfeld method or the remote viewing method. Uh, you can generate a successful uh, finding from mm, that. Yeah. And, and it seems as if it's replicable. The, the theory being but, that if you quiet the mind in some way, that that produces uh, enhanced reduce, scores. Yeah. If you reduce your, your cognition, your, con your brain, slow down your mind or disrupt it through chanting or drumming. Yeah. You know? But uh, so I'm a sociologist and I travel. I lived in Asia and I'm looking at these shamans and they're doing that. They're chanting and drumming and going into trance. And yet when I, when I watched them, uh, the actual rituals weren't actually generating paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. You weren't actually, I, was, I, I could walk over hot coals myself, but it's not necessarily paranormal. It, it seems as if the, the phenomena has this hiding quality. Yeah. And I noticed that in my, with my Missouri case, the entity letters, you know, and finally the book has come out. That book, I couldn't get that book published for decades, you know, mm -hmm. but the phenomena has a hiding quality. And uh, now certain researchers are able to get the phenomena. Hal put off and Harold, you know, Targ, put off and Targ and Charlie Tart, they get good success, but a lot of researchers can't. And when I read the parapsychologists, I found a lot of people couldn't really get the phenomena. That there is a there's something different about the phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's think about human consciousness. What is this thing which we're shutting down? What are we closing down in order to gain this to make this thing happen? And we notice well the, the ancient Homo sapiens actually had Homo erectus before. And they huddled around the fires, and they perhaps gained linguistic skill. And there, what, there must have been stages where they had some kind of symbolization. They gained a capacity to symbolize, and then they developed the capacity to, to develop a linguistic ability. Yeah. And they started painting walls, their walls. Mm -hmm. And, and in the 13,000 years ago, Made, made an image of a shaman on the wall or a, a kind of anthropomorphic animal man. Mm -hmm. So, so shamanism has been practiced for a long time and shamanism would have a degree of effectiveness. It has a degree of effectiveness even today. And that's in the realm of spiritual healing. Spiritual healing has a degree of effectiveness, Right? Yeah. All right. We can agree. That that's a replicable experiment. Because we have a placebo we have hypnotic effect and we have placebo effect, yeah. right? Right. And and that's very we can we can count on it. It's a very, very re replicable. The, the placebo Hypnosis, effect is, yes. Yeah. And 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 ha and has such a, a powerful effect that it would have had a it would have had evolutionary impact. Mm-hmm. That's this is what I'm thinking, you know. It would have had so those people living thirty thousand years ago in their caves, they would have had they would have provided survival of benefits because from the shamanic ceremonies. So I think it's fair to say that they learned how to activate placebo effects. Yes, and yeah. hypnosis. Sure, and hypnosis because they had drums yeah. and flutes. They had mm -hmm. they they made music and they were dancing. They yeah. knew how to dance. Yeah. So so people who. But but the, but there's a differential so there's a differential rate of survival. Now there's the people the skeptics would have been at a survival disadvantage. Yeah, they would have come down with an infection and died, <laughs> or if they had a wound, they would have bled to death, or a, probably childbirth was probably very was a very important factor. Childbirth uh, was probably the most uh, controllable disorder. People who responded to ritual healing during childbirth would have had a survival. Women would have had a survival advantage. Yeah, and so that would. So we find today women have a tendency to have a higher rate 
of anomalous experience, a higher rate of uh, spontaneous experiences and a higher level of belief. You found that in your surveys. The sociologists, and it's, it's quite replicable. Uh-huh. And women tend to be more spiritual and more religious all over the world. Mm. So this theory coincides with that. Yeah. And the, the theory would have provided survival benefits to people who had dissociative ability and absorption absorptive ability, the people who are more hypnotizable. Yeah. So, so we have a cycle of the people uh, selecting for people who have the propensity for unusual experience. They would have a survival advantage. Sure. I, I mean, yeah. all of that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So over time, we would have shaped our own capacity for spirituality. We would have, rather than becoming like chimpanzees who, are, who aren't very religious, we humans became spiritual. We became religious as a result of spiritual healing. So what you're suggesting is that regardless of what parapsychologists call psi phenomena, that the uh, social practices associated with magic, animism, uh, shamanism uh, had yeah. some survival value, and that's why they persisted. But that wouldn't explain why parapsychology as a science has persisted, would it? Well, parapsychology as a science persist, persisted because there's this huge percentage of people in the general, all populations all over the world mm-hmm. have a huge percentage of these people who are having these experiences and are very curious. We, we're very curious. What's going to happen after we die? Yeah. You know, and what, what could benefit us? What could help us live? What could help us to become happy and live to be, reach an old age? Mm-hmm. We're very much interested in survival. And, and suppose you come with a, down with a cancer or some terrible uh, medical problem. What can you do about it? And the scientists tell you that they can't do anything. Is it possible that spiritual healing could be effective? Mm-hmm. And it, it seems the case that it could be effective. Yes, most yeah. definitely. So people are very interested in this. And, and the parapsychologists are shedding light on these questions. Mm-hmm. So... Well, when you did your original work back in the 1970s, you mentioned there were some 30 parapsychology research centers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, today, now, uh, many decades later... Maybe there's seven. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. In, in one sense, it seems as if the field has shrunk uh, over time. And, and that original uh, theoretical model that I started out this presentation, it pointed out there's, there needs to be lay groups who are supportive of the parapsychologists. When I traveled around and visited those parapsychologists, they didn't want to answer their telephones. People were calling them, but they were too busy doing their laboratory research. The people outside the laboratory were having the powerful experiences. They, they wanted something that they could relate to. Now, the ones that exist today, like the, uh, there's, there's groups which are interested in UFOs, there's groups that are interested in uh, large-footed monsters, there's groups that are interested in near-death experiences and reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Now, there, there's the people who are in tune with the general public are gaining support. So, so that seems to be, and you, how you're gaining support. You know? <laughs> you're prospering. You I'm, I'm eking by. I, and, and I have to say this, I've never had a, a, a much in the way of employment as a parapsychologist since I got my doctoral degree in the field in 1980, but I've had a great life. I don't regret one minute of it. Because you're in harmony with what people want. You're you're fulfilling a need. People are interested in these programs, and, but I think also they love you personally. I think. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> Still, as an interviewer. <laughs> but now, one of the things that uh, intrigues me is that uh, I do think that that let's take psychology as as an example. Psychologists have been uh, the one profession that ought to be, in my opinion, the most interested in. Uh, the findings of extrasensory perception and psychokinesis, but they've been really amongst the most hostile. But recently, the American Psychological Association has been, after a long hiatus of, of not 
uh, even speaking about parapsychology, there have been several publications. They've published several books and articles in their flagship publication, The American Psychologist, favorable to parapsychology. So it strikes me that there is what's happening in our era right now is, is that at least in, in the field of psychology, a very important scientific discipline, the gatekeepers are beginning to loosen up a bit. Well, let's think about that. Uh, let's think about, uh, so let's suppose you're a 17 year old or an 18 year old man or woman and you're exposed the, to this information. Uh, uh, where, what could, what would be a career path for that person? If you go into psychology or sociology, you're going to be channeled into like, sociology has not changed that much. I, I just was reading re some recent work in sociology pertaining to this field, and they're still sticking to their tried and true paradigm. Uh, and they're not going to the, the, they're, they're, they're interviewing people who have haunting experiences, but there still is this category of deviant behavior. The, the, mm -hmm. the people are portrayed as there's being something wrong with them. Yeah. So what, so what I, you're saying is that you don't think there's, in your lifetime, since you did this research decades ago, you don't think that there's really been any significant progress? Well, there has been progress, yes. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to talk to you right now to try to, to point out how can, this, how can this progress continue and how yeah. can it be made? Uh -huh. So let, let's think about this list, these things, uh, paranormal dreams, apparitions, Spiritual healing, sleep paralysis, psychokinesis, out of body experience, religious experience, other waking extrasensory perception, near death experience, and UFOs. So I had my students in my classroom. We have all the, we have like a, a thousand, eighteen hundred stories. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I want, said, now which, which, which of these stories are the most interesting? Which of the stories are the most associated with psychological health? Which stories provide survival benefits? You know, which stories might we be able to use to go into the future and become successful if we're going to do research in these areas? You know, mm -hmm. and 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 I want we're going to code every kind of each of the adjectives, whether they're positive and negative, within the people when they're telling the stories. Mm -hmm. And you look at to say apparitions and paranormal dreams. There's a lot of negativity within these stories. There's the fear. There's reason to be afraid. The people have, you have a dream. Like, for example, here's a, here's a paranormal dream. The girl is t saying she was watching her brother and her, uh, her neighbor and her father. They were l loading lawnmowers on the back of a truck and that one of the lawnmower or the piece of equipment fell over and it crushed that she couldn't see who it was, but someone was crushed to death hmm. no like very negative yeah. and a lot of the paranormal dreams are very very negative mm -hmm. and a lot of apparitions are associated with a death mm -hmm. and especially a, a terrible death a tragic death yeah. and a sleep paralysis had to do with witches a curse upon you and mm -hmm. the person feels like they're going to be killed psychokinesis oftentimes has to do with a death a haunting you know it has to do with like haunting cases a lot of times uh a, a spirits come back, a restless spirit. Uh, now, the out-of-body experiences, a lot of those are positive. The people feel they're in pain and they leave their bodies and they, they feel better. And that it's, a, it's a kinship to a near-death experience. Those are, uh, half of them, a lot of them were negative, but some were positive. You know? So now we're getting to something which has an interest. People are interested in life after death and there's that, that thought, oh, this has to do with I have a soul and it can leave my body and I'll still be living, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. But the one kind of experience with spiritual healing, that is very, very positive. And the, the students felt that was the best kind of story. That was the story that they were most likely to tell other people. Mm. So we have a lot of folklore. How can you be healed? Let's suppose you have a burn. You should go visit a spiritual practitioner and then they'll get a certain verse from the Bible. They'll read it and your pain from your burn will go away and it won't blister and you will not have a scar it's a wonderful, wonderful situation. Suppose you come down with cancer. Well, go have a prayer group in your church, and they pray for you every week. And the people told the story, and the cancer. Now, a lot of times they went to a doctor, 
and they had an operation. But you know, a lot of times it doesn't work out. But the not that the story and the story it works out. Yeah. You know, wonderful, wonderful story. Mm -hmm. The people were healed. Mm -hmm. you no, know? and so it's a kind of a, a, a prescription for how you can live long and be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the pathway is mental health, uh, figuring out how to combine this way of thinking. There's 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 a certain population in our society or who are very, they have a lot of these kinds of experiences. It's very prevalent. And they believe in spirits, souls, life after death, and magical abilities. And it's a psychologically healthy situation. And that, I think, is a, and, and it makes for a psychologically healthy form of consciousness. Yeah. So your and advice that, to yeah. parapsychologists is to focus on healing. Well, to recognize that there are certain benefits and that the people who have these propensities, some of them have attained very uh, psychologically healthy ways, ways of thinking. And that, that, that allows a model for the rest of us, mm -hmm. a, a way of thinking about things, using your dissociative ability and using your absorptive ability and creating rituals which are beneficial to people. You know, like that's, that's going to be the, the pathway. And, and you've, you've had many, you've interviewed a lot of people who are doing that kind of thing, I think, on your program. Yeah. Really, yeah. a lot it, of people. It, it's true. I have. I haven't uh, tried to avoid those other scary areas. I've, I've, yeah. it, I enjoy all of it myself. Yeah, uh, but I I think that's excellent advice. Well, uh, Jim, this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, you've really given me some pause. You know, I sometimes get over optimistic. I think I was incredibly optimistic in the 1970s that parapsychology was going to revolutionize everything yeah. then and there. Uh, and now I can look back uh, from the vantage point of decades later and say it hasn't happened yet. I'm still uh, optimistic that eventually that revolution will come, but maybe not. Well, you know, there's a, it's a little bit disconcerting to live in a time where, uh, our, our own government is engaging in atrocities yeah. and, and that, you know, it, it doesn't bode well for the future. But, but the, the idea that tribulation and, and social difficulty, it seems to stimulate this kind of phenomena. There's, there's a reaction. The people that lived through the Cultural Revolution in the People's Republic of, of China, that was very, very difficult for them. But they, but they came out of it with this capacity for, the, for these kinds of experiences. It, it brings the, the problem itself. It's kind of like the, 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 you know, the Tao Te Ching, you yeah, know, the, yeah. the problem has a, has, there's a, there's a, a kernel of the solution or embedded arise. in the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So Jim, what are your current research interests? Well, I'm curious about people in foreign countries and different countries who are interested in this kind of thing, who are interested in paranormal phenomena or, or these kinds of experiences. And so if you're living in some place anywhere, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, you might send me a, a post or an email or something like that. Uh, because I'd be interested in, in creating contacts with people from a lot of different places. Because there's there's common features all over the world, but there's also different special cultural variations all over the world. It's very interesting to to look at that to see how the cultural variations are. Well, we'll link to your website if people check the uh, comments section on this video. We'll link there to your website so people can reach you through okay. your website. And you might as also check the comments section yourself because a lot of viewers just post comments and some of them may say they'd yeah. like to reach out to you. So I hope. Uh, as a result of this video that you do make some uh, interesting com contacts in exotic countries. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. It'll be fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing this time with me, Jim. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me.